You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered today. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, 
a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were. It's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, she uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siebel, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Did the ancient people even have the concept of a year that lasts 365 days? Yes and no. Mayan calendars had cycles. That's close to what we call a year. But the Mayan cycle was much longer. 8-19 days. And this is where the mystery begins. 8-19 days compared to what? When does this calendar begin, and when does it end? Scientists were asking themselves this question for decades. They discovered and deciphered the Mayan calendar during the 1940s. Recently, two American scientists, John Linden and Victoria Bricker, came forward with a solution. So, what did they do differently from their predecessors? The duo deciphered the code by broadening their thinking. They expanded the calendar from 819 days to full 45 years. That's 20 times longer than the original cycle. And a pattern started to emerge. This was a major breakthrough because the Maya told time in a complicated way. You can forget about the easy-to-read Arabic numerals we have today. These ancient people used glyphs. These are tiny images that represent characters. Something like the icons on your desktop or universal symbols. When you see a little dot with three curved lines above it, you know there is a Wi-Fi network available. 
the Mayan calendar used glyphs that represented animals or natural phenomena. For example, there were symbols for a jaguar and an eagle. Each glyph marked one day. Each cycle is repeated four times, 8 and 19 x 4. Let's call these four cycles blocks. The Mayas colored each block differently. Scientists thought these colors corresponded to the four cardinal directions. Red was east, white, north, west was black, and finally, yellow marked south. But then the 1980s came. Yeah, this was a weird decade. The calculations were all wrong. Researchers determined that the colors were associated with the position of the sun in the sky. It turned out that the color yellow represented the highest point of the sun, which is called a zenith. White was the lowest point, called the nadir. It seems that the calendar showed just how good the ancient Mayas were at astronomy. This is most evident at Chichen Itza. This principal Mayan city is located on the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico. There stands an impressive step pyramid. It is dedicated to the feathered serpent deity, and its alignment is perfect. Something marvelous happens here twice a year, during the equinoxes, March and September. These are the times when the sun shines directly over the equator. On these two dates, the day and night last the same. At the site of the pyramid, sunlight first illuminates the sculpture of the serpent head at the base of the structure. Then it makes its way up the 91 steps. This creates the illusion that a snake is slithering down the pyramid. Even today, people gather to witness the site. And it must have been more impressive when the Mayas completed the structure 1050-1300 CE. Do you know what a synodic period is? Neither do I. But Mayan astronomers did. A synodic period is the time that passes before a stellar body does a full lap. For example, this is the period between two full moons. When you look from Earth, this period lasts roughly 30 days. And the Mayas were looking at the skies non-stop. They carefully noted the synodic periods of all planets. From Venus to Saturn, these ancient astronomers kept records of nearly all celestial bodies. But what does this have to do with their calendar? The American researchers' calculations revealed the link. Let's take the planet closest to the Sun as an example, Mercury. Its synodic period is 117 days. Multiply that by 7 and you get which number? Exactly 8 to 19, 117 x7 equals sign 819? Coincidence? Definitely not. Because synodic periods of other planets also neatly match the magical figure, 819. But this is not visible from a single Mayan cycle. Scientists had to expand it several times to discover the pattern. There is a reason why no one could decipher the code for so long. They were focused on a single planet. The trick was to add the Mayan calculation for all the planets. Researchers just needed to see the bigger picture. This brings us to the year 2012. Can you remember that some people thought that the world would end on December 21st? That turned out to be a bust. We are alive and well now. But what started this false rumor? The Mayan calendar, of course. You see, these ancient people based their calendar on long periods of all the planets. That included a lot of complicated math and a lot of multiplying. This 2012 was simply the time when their cycle ended. It is known as the long count. This period is the same as our year. For the Mayas, 2012 was something like the 31st of December for us. Just an end of a cycle in which they measured time, so there was no need to panic. Those New Year's Eve parties might be a bit wild, but the world doesn't end on January 1st. The Mayas stretched more than their calendar. Rubber was the name of the game. Yes, you've heard it correctly. These ancient people were making different grades of rubber 3,000 years before one famous American did, Charles Goodyear. They would extract natural latex from the rubber tree. This is a milky substance that can be turned into rubber. And they weren't the only ones. Scientists found evidence that their neighbors, the Aztecs and the Olmecs, did the same. But what did they do with rubber? They didn't need car tires, definitely. But it's cool to have a nice pair of sandals for the beach. The Spanish wrote about rubber sole footwear that natives wore. Sadly, scientists still haven't found them. That would be a big step for archaeology. So the Maya were playful with rubber, literally. Researchers guessed that they produced balls from latex. These were bouncy and ranged in size from a softball to a soccer ball. A typical Mayan ball game, pits, involved two hoops. You must be thinking basketball, but not quite. The hoops were set on walls, 23 feet high. Compare that to the NBA standard of 10 feet. And the hoop was the other way around. There is also a sweet side to the story of the Mayas. 
These ancient people enjoyed chocolate. In fact, the modern word chocolate probably comes from their language, socolatl. This meant bitter water. Okay, you get the bitter part, but why water? The Mayas didn't produce chocolate in the form we know it today. They didn't make bars of chocolate, they drank it. Smashed cocoa beans made for excellent drinks. The Mayas perfected the mixture over time and even added spices. Anyone up for a fiery chocolate drink with stew peppers and cornmeal? Who knows, maybe this beverage actually tasted well. Cocoa beans were sacred and used as a currency. Researchers believe all social classes got to enjoy it. Free chocolate for all sounds nice even today. But where did the Mayas get clean water for their cocoa drinks? From the oldest known filtration system in the Western Hemisphere. It was based on zeolite. These are minerals that contain aluminum and silicone compounds. And guess what? Modern air and water purifiers still use this material. Mayan tech wins yet again. Back in Europe, Roger Bacon developed a sand filtration system in 1627, some 1,800 years after the Mayas. But what about regions without rivers, lakes, or springs? Mayan engineers had it all figured out. Rainwater. They would carve out large reservoirs in the limestone bedrock. Then, they would coat these underground caves with a layer of a watertight material. The final step was to make small channels that collected water from the hills above. Scientists estimated that just one of these reservoirs could hold on average 10,000 gallons of rainwater, enough to fill 55 modern hot tubs. Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsihir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu Underground City was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact, fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, 
nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces, not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the Temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. 
Thonis Heraklion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the 2nd century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heraklion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heraklion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heraklion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heraklion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heraklion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures in the park. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.